With the fourth biggest surface area of all the countries in South America, Colombia covers an area twice the size of France. Lying at the northern extremity of the Cordillera of the Andes, Colombia's highest point rises to 5,800 meters. Thanks to the way its mountains reach into the clouds, Colombia has plentiful reserves of fresh water. They're among the largest on the planet. The rainy season swells the watercourses, many of which feed the Amazon basin, the largest in the world. Colombia has a great diversity of landscapes. Plains wind between the mountains and sometimes open out into fertile plateaus. Between the peaks and the shoreline, the differences in altitude give rise to a very varied tropical climate. The vegetation has adapted itself to the climatic conditions. Colombia is one of the countries in the world that offers the widest biodiversity. Some plant species are very rare. Some still hide their secrets, while others are much more conspicuous, like the coca. The country is the meeting point for many animal species. The fauna is very interesting, especially the birds. For example, the toucan, which has more than one trick in its beak. In Colombia, several Amerindian civilizations mastered work in gold. They were at the origin of El Dorado, a mythical region where gold was said to be found in abundance. In the hope of reaching El Dorado and getting their hands on incomparable emeralds, the Spanish landed here at the beginning of the 16th century. The conquerors were horrified by certain cannibalistic peoples. They imposed the Catholic religion and their own institutions. The native people were mistreated and finally exterminated, to be replaced by Africans. Later, all Colombians rallied in support of the liberator, Simon Bolivar, in order to win their independence. Freedom and order are daily priorities in a country which, for over 50 years, has fought against a guerrilla war waged by rebel factions. In spite of tensions, Colombia has set up a presidential regime whereby the head of state is elected by universal suffrage. Society is multiracial, and 60% of the population is of mixed race. Descendants of the Spanish have melted into today's Colombia. <laughs> Access to education is difficult in a system where 70% of the teaching is in the hands of the private sector. Colombia has long been considered as the most Catholic of Latin American countries, but this does not preclude the presence of other religions. The Spanish brought their culture that Colombia then enriched, notably with the writer Gabriel García Márquez. Colombian creation and culture are evidence of a startling vitality. Folklore and music are two examples. And the carnival is living proof. Colombia has nearly 47 million inhabitants, three quarters of whom live in the towns. But the conditions of urban life are not the same for everybody. There is a very large gap between rich and poor. Colombia has generous reserves of oil. It is also a great exporter of coal and nickel. And this industry occupies a quarter of the active population. Having access to two oceans is also a huge advantage for trade. In the eastern Cordillera, at a height of 2,600 meters, Bogotá, the capital, spreads over an immense plain. With over 7 million inhabitants, including its suburbs, the population has more than doubled in 30 years. Traffic congestion has been partly solved by the Transmilenio, a bus network that runs in its own bus lanes. At the foot of the mountains, we find Bogotá's origins in Bolivar Square. It is situated on the site of the first houses built by the Spanish. However, 
It was a French architect who rebuilt the town hall at the beginning of the 20th century. People who lost their land because of the guerrilla war inspired a Colombian artist. They are represented by ants crawling all over the building of the National Congress. The old town of Bogota is laid out like a checkers board with dead straight main arteries. As well as the avenues, the carreras run north to south, while the streets, the calles, run east to west. This is a plan that reproduces that of Spanish towns of the colonial period. The historic heart of the town seems to come straight from Andalusia. Here, the past is very present. Founded in 1538, the town was originally called Santa Fe. Santa Fe is a very common name in countries of Hispanic culture. It means holy faith. The town later became Santa Fe de Bogota, in reference to a great Indian chief. The trading tradition is very old in a town set at the crossroads of communication routes. Mobile phones can be rented for very precisely timed calls. Anything can be bought on the streets, even emeralds. This one is worth about 15 million pesos, $7,500. You can let yourself dream of wealth in a town that was once called the South American Athens. The south of Colombia is divided between the vast Amazonian forest and the parallel ranges of mountains. Heading south, as we leave the high plateaus of the eastern Cordillera, the altitude drops sharply. The road is mainly used to transport to Bogota goods that have been brought from the Atlantic Ocean up the river Magdalena, the main Colombian waterway. Transport used to be by rail. At the daily market, local products attract consumers, particularly the tropical fruits. The landscape gradually rises again. We reach the central Cordillera in the region where the river Magdalena has its source. It's still fairly small here. They say it's the size of a torrent that you can jump across. But the leap into the void at the river Bordones is rather more frightening. Sugarcane, grown here since the 16th century, is one of the oldest crops in the country. Between sugarcane harvests, in the area of San Agustin, life slips gently by. This small town of 30,000 inhabitants was founded very late by the Spanish, at the end of the 18th century. But the place had already been inhabited, as can be seen in an exceptional archaeological discovery, a group of mysterious sculptures. The statues, carved out of monoliths, tell us little of their history. We know practically nothing of the civilization that produced them. The statue behind us here represents the birth of a child. At the top you can see the phases of reproduction symbolized by nine moons. The statues of San Agustin represent important personalities in the society, such as shamans. It is estimated that the statues were created between the 2nd century BC and the 10th century AD. Tombs and divinities inhabit a site that remains a mystery. In the southwest of the country, the Cauca department has a bocage-type landscape, 
with meadows and hedgerows that divide the plots of farmland. Here they raise cows that are as at home as they would be in mountain pastures. The altitude cools the temperatures and the volcanic earth is good for growing the grass that's watered by frequent rains. Every Tuesday in the village of Silvia, a colorful crowd comes to the market. The Guambiano Indians come in from the surrounding area. They wear heavy boots, three-quarter length skirts, short ponchos, brightly colored scarves and hats. The governor of their community thinks the Guambianos are quite original. The characteristics of the Guambiano, we have a certain political autonomy in almost all areas, particularly in the fields of education and health. We have our own language, the Namrich. And culturally, we have our own clothes, as well as the scarf and the hat. When the market is over, the Guambianos go back home on the Chivas, their public transport. In the north, the Caribbean Sea laps the country's shores. The town of Cartagena lies in an ideal position, sheltered in a bay. Behind its port area, Cartagena has expanded greatly. Today it numbers a million inhabitants. From its very beginnings, the town took on such importance that it had to be solidly protected. The Spanish built towering fortifications to dissuade any aggressors. The sea could be scanned from the tops of surrounding hills. La Popa Monastery is perched on one of these. It was established at the beginning of the 17th century and restored by the monks of St. Augustine. All the wealth taken away from South America by the Spanish transited by Cartagena. The town became the doorway to the continent and very soon prospered. The colonial architecture reflects the opulence of the town and is still the inspiration for modern buildings. The town was destroyed by fire in the middle of the 16th century because all the houses were made of wood. The town was rebuilt with more fire-resistant materials and has survived to the present day. A young and dynamic town, Cartagena is a shop window for artistic creation. There are many cultural events and exhibitions. The open spaces are full of sculptures depicting daily life, secular traditions or the history of the country. You don't necessarily leave Cartagena by road. You can go via the beach, which is the shortest way to get to the nearest fishing village. Even the bus takes this shortcut. There has been a demographic explosion in Cartagena. In 60 years, the population has been multiplied by five. But the birth rate, for a long time stimulated by the Catholic Church, is today under control. Forty years ago, women had, on average, more than five children. Today, they have fewer than three. The population is also very young. One third of Colombians are under 18. And most of them love football. South of Cartagena, the village of San Basilio de Palenque was founded by escaped African slaves. The local traditions and the language spoken here originated in Africa. Order! 
The founder of the village is literally worshipped by the people. Among ourselves, we call the founder Benkos Biojo. He founded Palenque around 1603. For the black population, the locality enjoys great prestige. It was the first village of free black slaves in South America. Social organization by age groups is copied from the African model. Even the youngest learn to fight to live. Many Colombian boxers hail from here. Even the communications take their inspiration from Africa. This is the main drum for the people of Palenque. It was our instrument for communicating with other communities. The Bueltiao Sombrero is part of the Colombian scene. A small volcano has even taken on its shape. El Totumo, the clay mountain. There's no lava here, but a mud rich in mineral salts. People come from afar to bathe here and enjoy its properties. After a dip in liquid clay, they go down along the cone of the volcano for a little ablution. It's a moisturizer. There's water not far away, a mixture of fresh water and seawater. When you leave Cartagena and travel along the Caribbean coast towards the north, you soon reach the large town of Barranquilla. Barranquilla is colorful and lively throughout the year. But in the days leading up to Lent, you can feel the excitement mounting. Colors are spruced up. The visitors come from far off. You feel that something special is going to happen. Everyone, big and small, is busy with the final details. Pastry cooks, too, are getting ready for the party, giving unusual shapes and colors to their creations. In the streets appear strange vehicles and characters. The town's beginning to jump. Groups home in on a meeting place. There's a distant rumbling. There won't be long to wait. The first teams are starting to move. It's the beginning of the procession, one of the most famous in Latin America, the Barranquilla Carnival. One museum celebrates the carnival. Alfredo de la Espriella. It's one of the transcendental facets of popular culture in Colombia. The carnival is a continual movement. It's a popular expression. Apart from the artistic or popular aspect, it's very funny. The carnival, quite honestly, is fancy dress, funny faces, laughs, tomfoolery. That's what the carnival is. The Barranquilla Carnival lasts four days and four nights. But for months beforehand, people are getting ready. Groups endlessly rehearse the movements of the cumbia, a dance which combines elements of Amerindian, African and Spanish origin. Antonia is a choreographer. The cumbia is known throughout the world. It's one of the oldest roots of our carnival. And as well as the cumbia, we have lots of different dances and music. That's why we've been declared a world cultural heritage. The Barranquilla Carnival is unique in the world for its cultural diversity. Adriana Romero, 
It's a multi-rhythmic carnival. The Barranquilla Carnival boasts over 13 cultural expressions, like the cumbia, the congo, the mapele, the son de negro, extras, litanies. And these all perpetuate the very essence of ancestral traditions. For the Barranquilleros, we feel a pride and a passion. For us, it's very gratifying that our city is known as the capital of happiness. Viva the Barranquilla Carnival! Hi, the carnival is great. The origins of the Barranquilla Carnival are very old. They go back to the days when the African slaves would sing, dance, and dress up, pretending to be their masters. This was a very common practice in the Caribbean. Each area of the city has its own beauty queen. The most beautiful will be elected queen of the carnival. Elizabeth represents the Abajo neighborhood. This contest used to be called the People's Queens of the Carnival. Each of the queens from a popular neighborhood would present the cultural particularity of her neighborhood. One of the high points of the Barranquilla Carnival is the Battle of the Flowers. Beside the Caribbean traditions, the parade touches on current political events, guerrilla activities and other delicate subjects, like the fight against drug trafficking, often making fun of them. During the carnival, anything goes. There are also baddies in the procession whose aim is to scare you. The rejoicing goes on all night long. Fortunately, refreshments are on hand. Colombian music has its roots in complex and varied origins. The mixture of Spanish, African and Caribbean influences creates an explosive result. The town of Barranquilla owes a lot to the great Magdalena River. Where its mouth opens into the Caribbean Sea, alluvians have created an enormous estuary. At the Cienaga Grande de Santa Marta, on thousands of acres of lagoon, the earth and the sea come together. This is a sanctuary for wildlife, but the exposed land is worked by the inhabitants from the shore. They collect sea salt. The salt provides the villagers with a meagre living. Many of them work more directly with the sea, building fish breeding beds.
But apart from salt, there are other ways of making a living that are original. These are iguana eggs. I sell them to tourists. The way of eating them is very simple, and the verdict is undeniable. Delicious. Further north, the town of Santa Marta is situated between the tip of the Cordillera of the Andes and the Caribbean Sea. It was the first town in South America to be founded by the Spanish. The cathedral dates from those days. The city rapidly became prosperous, and the public buildings attest to this. Animals like the iguana and the tentacularly banyan tree are typical of this tropical Caribbean climate. It was in Santa Marta that Simon Bolivar died. Hispano-American countries should have been united by the liberator. That was but a dream. Nestling against the side of a mountain, the village of Taganga also seems part of a dream. This little old fishing port lives at a lazy rhythm today. The many passing visitors can enjoy a well-sheltered beach. The Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta is the highest mountain region in Colombia, with peaks rising to almost 6,000 meters. When the Spanish arrived in the region, they encountered fierce resistance from the Tayronas Indians, some of the most enlightened of Colombian peoples. The Tyronas took refuge in a dense rainforest, and their name has since been given to a national park. There is total cooperation between living species. Roots imitate snakes. Some species use earth to make their homes in trees. And this lizard, a specialist in imitation, passes for a liana. As for the Atta ant, you could even talk of symbiosis. The leaves they cut are used for growing the mushrooms that they eat. Enormous blocks of rock appear in the undergrowth. In the midst of this jumble of stone is a familiar shape, like those drawn by the Kogis Indians, descendants of the Tyronas. The rock's egg shape matches the Kogis Indians' cosmic vision of the Sierra Nevada. For them, the world is oval, like an egg, thus the shape of the rocks. Erosion has fashioned the rocks into some equally amazing shapes. In the national park, the farmers used to supply drug dealers by growing coca. The government has helped them to find a new living by opening country lodgings close to nature. This is what Celso Lopez has done. So, thanks to that, we built this lodging for tourists. And while they're staying here, we explain things to them. Like, for example, what the myth of the sun is because it's important for them and for everyone. These Indian-style dwellings are built using local materials. This bungalow has a very beautiful name, Earth. The Earth is our mother. When we die, we are put in the Earth. In fact, the Earth gives us everything. The Tayrona Park also includes a part of the coast along the Caribbean Sea. Here the waves have sculpted the rocks using their own imagination. Sandy beaches line a coast that is still wild, 
washed with cold and violent currents. The fauna make it their own, and pelicans play to their heart's content. On the line of the long central and western cordilleras are situated the country's largest cities outside Bogota, Cali and Medellin. At an altitude of 1,500 meters, Medellin strikes by the dominant color of its brick. Founded in the beginning of the 17th century, the town has developed quite recently. Its three million inhabitants live in a valley with a pleasant climate. Medellin is even called the city of eternal springtime. Alas, the town was long plagued by cocaine trafficking. Infrastructures have developed considerably around the metro, thanks to which the city's entire economy has been galvanized, especially in the valley of the Medellin River that runs through the whole city from north to south. Constructed in 1995, the metro transformed the lives of many of Medellin's inhabitants. Formerly, to get to the city center, it took a good half day's travel for residents in the hills bordering the valley. Whole neighborhoods were isolated, left to their own devices. Today, a cable car brings residents to a metro station, so the comunas, the slums, have been opened up. It takes only an hour to get to work in the city center. And in the Santo Domingo area, which formerly had a very bad reputation, delinquency has practically disappeared. Today, calm and security reign. But this is not due solely to transport. Residents have found new interests. The success of the cultural center in the shape of a diamond is proof of this. Juan Uribe is the director. In the 80s and 90s, uh, this neighborhood was very bad, very dangerous, because the uh, mafia used to recruit the hitmen from this uh, section now with the help of the government and a lot of social programs, this, this uh, neighborhood becomes much, much better. Very peaceful, uh, a lot of working, low working class people. Everybody mind their own business, keep the place nice and clean. And they respect a lot, the library, the cable, they're very proud of it. The young are no longer idle. They are taken in hand and all the different types of trafficking are replaced by educational activities. In the Medellin skyline, one building stands out for its originality. It has been given the shape of a sewing machine needle. This is a way of paying tribute to the fashion trade, one of the most profitable activities in the town. In the last few years, the town has become a reference throughout Latin America in this field. The boutiques in Primavera Street show the main tendencies in Colombian design. In the field of design, another citizen of Medellin has taken a very original path, Fernando Botero. He describes himself as the most Colombian of Colombian artists. Indeed, he took his inspiration from Amerindian art to create works that are instantly recognized. Conrad Uribe knows Botero very well. He is not interested in depicting fact people, as many people, as many people would think, but he's much more interested in the volume, in the, round, in the roundness and the shapes of forms. He's much more interested in the sensuality of forms. In a way, we can say that he exaggerates, he pumps up 
the figures, he pumps up volume, he exaggerates the proportion of things. The Antiochia Museum has brought together other works by Botero, who is an exceptional artist in that he has achieved fame and fortune during his lifetime. A sculptor and painter, Botero often adds a touch of humor to the picture he paints of his fellow beings. Botero has been inspired by the tango, of which Medellin, like Buenos Aires, is a mecca. <laughs> South of Medellin, the plain narrows between the central and the western cordilleras. The conditions are very propitious for farming. Firstly, the land with its volcanic origin is extremely fertile, and then the warm, damp climate is refreshed by the altitude. The conditions are ideal for banana trees, which require very rich earth. Conditions are also ideal for raising animals. The horse and the cow were imported into South America by the Spanish colonists. A starchy food that's very widespread in the tropics, plantains, are cooked on the grill. Conditions are very favorable for one crop that has made a reputation for Colombia all over the world, coffee. The coffee tree is usually grown at an altitude of over a thousand meters. The berries are picked by hand and production is strictly regulated. Alberto Hernandez. The characteristics? Well, the coffee from this estate is certified. We can't use strong chemicals. We try to produce a very high quality coffee and always keep the same proportions in the cup. Colombia is one of the leading coffee producers in the world. In the southwest, in the foothills of the Cordillera, under the protection of Christ the King, we find the town of Cali, nicknamed the Sultan of the Valley. With two million inhabitants, the town has expanded greatly since it was founded beside the little river Cali. The town has a very varied heritage. The neo-Gothic church of La Ermita was built in the middle of the 20th century in a somewhat anachronistic style. There are few monuments of the colonial era in Cali. The Saint-Francois church with its baroque shapes only goes back to the 18th century. The town's emblem is the cat. This animal was venerated by many peoples in South America, notably by the Incas. It appears frequently in pre-Columbian art. Cali has a feeling for entertainment. At the crossroads, motorists make the most of it. The town is a reference for shows because it is the capital of the salsa. Why is Cali the world capital of salsa? Because we are recognized the world over as dancers who use original techniques for our foot movements and also for our rhythm. That's why we're the world capital of salsa. There are hundreds of salsa schools and every evening you can dance in a different place. Cali is known as the town that never sleeps. Colombia has a lot going for it. 
It has stepped away from its turbulent past and is now turning towards the future. If you need convincing, you just have to look at the warmth of a smile.